Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Boyles. I'm executive director of Mass Humanities. I'm so glad to have all of you here for the latest installment of In Residence, our weekly series of communications and conversations with leaders in the humanities in Massachusetts and around the country. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be speaking with our guest, Rhonda Anderson, uh, for about 40 minutes, after which I'll be taking questions um, from all of you. So if you'd like to, throughout the conversation, drop your questions into the chat, I'll happily relay them uh, as we go. Mass Humanities uh, just this fall awarded 56 grants to organizations around Massachusetts that serve traditionally marginalized communities through the humanities. One of these organizations was the Okiteo Cultural Council, uh, which is based in Asheville and has as its mission to create opportunities uh, for the indigenous communities of that region. We're so fortunate today to welcome uh, Rhonda Anderson, a founding member of Okiteo, um, as well as the Commissioner uh, for Indian Affairs for Western Mass. Rhonda, so good to see you. Ah, it's really good to see you too, Pagala Gitsi. <laughs> Last time I saw you was on the river. I was thinking about that. We, uh, we, we took an amazing kayak trip just, that was, I guess three weeks ago, it was organized by State Senator Joe Comerford. Yeah, yeah that was fabulous. What a day. <laughs> and I just keep thinking about how placid the water was and that we just, we were in this dreamscape, it felt like for, I, I was on there for four hours, but I think you were on for a good bit longer. Yeah, I went the whole distance. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to try and cover a lot of ground today, um, but with all of our guests, I start this question. Um, this has been a trying year for all of us, and I think we all look for things that we can rely on, um, places of inspiration, whether that's a reading or a piece of music or a place that's really helping you get through all of the pressures that are on each of us in 2020. So I thought I'd start by, by asking you, what's, what's bringing you strength this year? Okay, first, uh, let me... Greet you in my traditional language. So, Pagalagisi, Anupiak Shinaga Olak, Tanak Shinaga Rhonda Anderson, Pang Makpak Anuanuranga Korinami, Shavaktunga, Western Massachusetts Commissioner on Indian Affairs and founder and co director of Okiteo. Koyanak Nalag Nagisi. So, thank you and thank you for listening. So, I just greeted you in my traditional language um, and I am speaking to you from Colrain which is the traditional homelands of Sakoki, Abenaki, and Pakamtuk, which is on the Pakamagon watershed, known today as a green river. So the Pakamagon River has been a major source of strength um, for myself, my family, um, my daughter, her friends. They have been gathering there faithfully at least once a week, sometimes more, since April, we have um, and we are incredibly lucky to be stewards of a nice piece of private land on the Green River. And there's meadows, there's forests, deep, deep swimming place, and it's just an escape. There's also no cell. So it's been a detox from screens. You know, we've been on these screens nonstop for months now. So <laughs> It's amazing to see 17-year-old kids, you know, running through the woods and sitting by the fire, talking to each other, sharing stories and playing. Um, and that has been so rejuvenating, not only, you know, to see our kids do this, but as parents, you know, know knowing that we're doing the right thing and we can all get together and commiserate and <laughs> talk about everything that we're doing. Um, and that has also been just incredible. Uh, food cooked over the fire, there's nothing better. So that has been an incredible um, grounding place, a place of strength, a place of unity and community. Um, I am eternally grateful to be here um, in, in this place in Massachusetts. And as you talked about Zoom, we know that we all have our technical difficulties. So I, I hear you. I think that being out here in Western Mass, but also being with my kids has been the silver lining of this entire experience. And I, I really don't know if I could have made it this far without all of them. We're going to talk about your work in Western Mass, um, but I wanted to start because 
Um, you are uh, originally from Alaska, and your native enrollment vi village of Kakatovik. Uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about there as a starting place, and and, and where you grew up, and and maybe um, describe for us what's going on there today as well, and how it relates to your work. Whoo! So I was actually thinking of possibly trying a screen share because it's a lot going on. And it's so hard for people to imagine a place that is so different than uh, their ordinary lives. So if that's okay, can I screen share a small little bit about Kaktovik? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, let's do that. Let's see if I have it. Um, I think I've, I've handed over the, the reins. Yeah. Oh, look. Okay. So that that's where we are right now. We are we are right here. Um, okay. So let's talk about Koktovik. This is my traditional village in Koktovik. Let me know. I have very limited bandwidth, so let me know if things get too wonky. <laughs> um, but this is this is Kaktovik up here um, in area uh, 1002 of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is the wildlife refuge here in green. Um, it is on the northernmost part, the north slope of Alaska on the Beaufort Sea. And um, it's a whaling village. Let me try to go to full screen here. That would be easier. There we go. Um, it's a whaling village and uh, twice a year there are more polar bears than humans and right now is one of those times. Um, this is a picture of my grandmother sitting in her sister's lab. Uh, she is the youngest by 14 years and the youngest of 12 children. Um, these are my, my great-grandmother and her sister who I'm named after, Alok my uh, grandfather Johnny, my dad and I, he grew up in Fairbanks, just like I was born in Fairbanks. So he grew up uh, having an ordinary, you know, most people would consider it ordinary and, and see, you know, he was in softball, lots of college. Um, oh no. <laughs> now let's see if I can get it to go. We might have to yeah, take Ah, there we go. There we go. So um, this is a, a picture in Koktovik. This is actually a cousin of mine, uh, Marie Rexford, um, standing in front of Maktak. Um, as a whaling village, um, you know, our entire village shows up um, anytime that a whale is caught, school is canceled, jobs are shut down, everyone shows up in the community to harvest the whale. Um, we have incredible feasts, we have dances, um, we have, you know, it's, it, we are, uh, our entire culture is based on this, in, including our games. Our games show our strengths um, as Inupiat people um, to be living in the cold weather climate and to be hunters and gatherers. As you can see, there's ear weights of 15 pounds, there's ear pulls, that's to show the strength of frostbite. Um, there are seal skinning contests, the knuckle hop. Um, but this is all in, at a threat right now, uh, not only with climate change, like this is um, the change in the ice pack. This has been, this is last year's ice pack. As you can see, this is about where Kaktovik is right here. And the ice pack is very thin. And that is causing a lot of problems with uh, with getting subsistence foods. The ice pack is no longer safe to travel on and uh, you have to go further and further out to get your food. Uh, as you can see, this is where you do camping when you're whaling or hunting for seal or walrus. It can be very dangerous. People are falling in or the ice is breaking off. And it's also a buffer against waves. And without any sea ice, over 200 communities in Alaska are at ground zero for uh, climate change and they are facing the destructions of melting permafrost, um, flooding, 
all, all kinds of ills. So um, melting permafrost also is eroding uh, coastline uh, the highest rate in the world. It's also um, causing um, our ice cellars to fail. Ice, ice cellars that in my village of Koktobik, there were hundreds to thousands of years old. And there was only one left um, just a few years ago. And uh, they actually went to a heat sinking or a heat displacement technology <laughs> to keep a community ice cellar going um, with 80 to 90% uh, food that is subsistence gathered and hunted, um, it is an absolute risk to, to not be able to, to keep food. Um, the wildlife up there is showing the signs of uh, climate change with sores, open sores, and even ticks. Yes, there are ticks <laughs> in circumpolar Alaska. It's insane. Uh, it's causing anemia and you know, the meat is just inedible. Um, it's not safe to eat. Um, the fish, the fish as well, are showing signs of mold. <laughs> mold, can you stand that? So that also makes it inedible. This again, this is, um, you know, we have to take a look at what is happening up there. So all these little dots, is extractive industry that's already there. This is in Prudhoe Bay and the National Petroleum Reserve. This is area 1002. This has, was set aside in the 1980s by President Carter for further exploration of extractive industry. And in 2017, uh, the Trump administration opened up this area to drilling um, and extractive industry by tucking the proposal into the tax bill of 2017. This is my village right here. So once this is all opened up, it's uh, 1.8 uh, million acres, I believe. And the plan that is passed by Bureau of Land Management is to open up almost the entirety of it. My village will become literally an island. There, you cannot cross once there's drilling there, it becomes a national security risk. So this area is also where the porcupine caribou herd, which is this brown line, they travel some 3,000 miles in a circular pattern throughout the year, and this is where they calve their babies. Let's see if I can go to the next one. Right, so this is the only place on the North Slope that is habitable um, for babies because the mosquitoes are so strong, they can be killed in a matter of hours. Um, so we're really trying to make people aware that the Anupia and Gwich'in people have depended on caribou for thousands of years. Um, the Gwich'in actually call this place Lisik Wachang Gwandi Gudlit, which is the sacred place where life begins. They actually don't enter this land whatsoever because they consider it so sacred. This is where literally life begins. You don't go there. And the Gwich'in depend pretty much entirely on the porcupine caribou herd for their subsistence. Um, the Gwich'in also believe that what befalls the caribou befalls the Gwich'in. So, um, it is super important to make sure that we're that we're voicing our concern that this is happening. So just recently, <laughs> the Bureau of Land Management um, okayed a plan to do seismic testing. They are uh, thirty ton trucks with big flat. Um, ground penetrating like uh, sound machines and they go across they're called thumper trucks and they go across the tundra and they make seismic uh they do seismic testing to see if there's oil it happened in the 80s and you can still see the tracks there today the thing is with these polar bears is that they are an accepted casualty of this testing. So these polar bears are denning in the wintertime, giving birth to little tiny polar bears. They're very tiny and they will not leave their den because they believe their den is safe. When they hear something coming, they are an accepted casualty. They will be killed through this uh, seismic testing. Um, so I have, I've gone to DC, I've spoken to the Bureau of Land Management, 
Actually, this, this guy right here, he sat on the Bureau of Land Management and he later took a job with Hill Corp, which is the one of the few uh, extractive industry um, corporations that will be drilling or attempting to drill in Area 1002. Um, I also went to DC to hear the bill um, to try to stop the drilling. I have gone to speak to the CEO of um, Conoco Phillips in Houston, Texas, and I've traveled to Aberdeen, Scotland to speak to the president, CEO, and board of BP and their risk assessment team, both of which um, Conoco Phillips and BP have pulled out of Area 1002. Um, I have spoken to three different banks in uh, the UK, and all three banks have provided policy. Um, to no longer fund drilling in the Arctic. Um, we also, we also uh, had an alliance with Greenpeace. That was hilarious because I am, you know, a whaling village. Um, and I've also been in marches, you know, all across the country. This is, this is one that was in New York City, uh, the, the climate strike march. That was amazing. So I wanted to like throw all of that in there. I know that's, a, that's just a lot, but I wanted to put that in there because you opened the door, Brian. <laughs> Not many people know about what's happening in your national forest today. And I think it's super important to be aware um, that this extractive industry is looming on our doorstep. The Trump administration wants to have the lease sale done by the end of December. So, you know, all hands on deck, I, I feel like. <laughs> that's, just, that's just one of the things that's going on with my village right now. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of it. It seems almost limitless what some people are willing to sacrifice in order for extractive industries to continue their march. And also is important to know that climate change continues to impact indigenous communities in ways that unfortunately get buried, I think, sometimes in the larger narrative. And I'm curious, when you do the advocacy work you do there, how the stories of your community and the, the traditional values and the ways that that way of life cannot be lost, how you're able to actually, I think, make that case and, and show why, you know, no amount of oil that is drilled could replace the type of cultural heritage and way of life that exists there. I imagine I, I could guess what the case is that you make, but pretend for a minute that I'm a banker and you're and you're explaining to me just who those people are and why they must continue to live there. Well, I tell you what, when I went to uh, speak with the risk assessment team at BP, we had uh, a 30 minute window of time and we ended up being there for an hour. And it is challenging to get people to understand what, what sacred means. What sacred means to you, Brian, might mean something entirely, it, it does, it means something entirely different to us. And so one thing that I know that was in common and what actually turned the light on upstairs in this meeting is I asked the two assessment officers, do you have children? And they said, yes. And I said, this is why I live in Massachusetts, because the man camps that are associated with the extractive industry, they contribute to the highest rates of murdered, missing indigenous women, the highest rates of sexual assault on native women in this continent, never mind America, Canada, this continent. I do not want my child to be living there and face that risk of being sexually assaulted, being taken from us, murdered, missing for the rest of her life. I don't want my child to face the prospect of having cancer in the future. Our cancer rates are extraordinarily high up on the North Slope. I don't want my child to grow up with diabetes because she doesn't have the access to the food that she needs that's nutritious. I don't want my child to have asthma because she's breathing in the toxic petrochemical air that is so prevalent now on the North Slope. Do you want your children to be living this life? And one of those men cried. He actually felt it, he heard it. And when he put his child into that situation, 
I feel like we were both on the same page at that time. Sure, that, that common humanity puts someone on a different plane or, or the same plane and they're able to weigh the choices that they're making with their stock, their shareholders. We're talking about people who can sometimes be invisible um, when those decisions are made. It, in knowing a bit about Okiteo, I think that what's important um, is that you're not just looking at the history of Native people, but rather that these communities persist, that we are living as neighbors today. You and I were saying at the beginning how we took this amazing kayak trip together on down the Connecticut River, and you were generous enough at some of the stops that we took with Senator Comerford to really tell us more about the communities that, that had been uh, along the river, but also continue to be there today. I don't want to keep doing hypotheticals, but I, I'm still relatively new to this region. It would be good, I think, uh, for people listening to just to hear a little bit from you about the indigenous communities who live in Western Mass, the people that, that are here now that you're still serving through Okiteo's work. Okay, so um, one of the main tribes that Okiteo serves is Nipmuc. And uh, Nipmuc means the people of the fresh water. And of course, they're still here in uh, Massachusetts. They do have a small um, reservation of land that was never ceded. It's, it's about five acres, I believe. Um, and uh, as well, there is um, Abenaki. Abenaki are still here. They're um, actually, we, we have, you know, it, it, we don't, I don't like using boundaries, um, you know, like Vermont and Massachusetts, and those are a colonial construct. Um, but Abenaki is traditionally more in the Southern Vermont, um, Northern Massachusetts area, but we have several Abenaki uh, living here in Western Massachusetts as well. Um, and, you know, of course we, you know, we have, um, to the East, there's the Massachusetts uh, Wampanoag bands, um, the tribe that tribe that's there. Um, to the south, of course, there's Mohegan, um, Pequot. Um, to the west, um, the traditional uh, Mohican. They are they still maintain tribal land in or near Troy, New York. Um, and I believe that the tri uh, tribal historic preservation officer um, has an office in Williamstown now, at least for a short period of time. Uh, that particular band, the Mohican band, um, were pushed west with the Stockbridge and Muncie bands in the late 1700s, right through uh, 1800s to Wisconsin, um, where they sort of landed on Menomonee, Menomonee tribal land, um, and they have their own reservation there uh, today. And of course, to the north, um, there's Abenaki, um, and to the northeast, you know, there's Passamaquoddy, um, there's Penobscot, Mi'kmaq. Um, there's a lot of indigenous people. Um, and of course, there's a lot of transplants, like myself, you know, living in Massachusetts. Um, but it's important to understand that, you know, we're still here in Massachusetts. We may have, um, we're only 0.6% of the population, um, but that's still 50,000 strong. Um, and you are absolutely correct. Like we are invisible um, in mainstream society. Um, you know, oftentimes I'll ask people, when was the last time you went to a movie theater and saw the protagonist um, as a native family just doing ordinary things, you know, we're not talking dances with wolves tech kind of stuff, but a contemporary family, maybe the dad was a dentist, you know, <laughs> something completely ordinary. It just doesn't happen. When was the last time you turned on the radio and listened to, um, you know, an indigenous pop star uh, singing, you know, uh, mainstream tribal music? That doesn't happen. When was the last time you turned on the TV and saw a TV show, which I think is actually coming soon? Um, you know, just an average ordinary family that's native, it, talking about our native issues today, you know, talking about our culture, just it just doesn't happen. We're completely invisible. And one of the visibilities that we do have, unfortunately, 
is through mascotry. And um, yes, Okiteo has been um, the last panel we did uh, through the um, the series that we've been we've been working on is uh, talking about cultural appropriation and mascots. Um, I think it's really important um, to to bring that up because we do have um, our outcomes are directly tied in with the stereotype and biases that mascots create. It ties into you know our what how do we perceive ourselves um and you know our our possible outcomes it also affects non-native um children you know how do they think of native people but it just doesn't stay in schools these mascots it goes out into the community and you know again i'm not going to play you know, oppression Olympics here, but it's actual facts. You know, we are murdered and missing at higher rates. We um, we have teen uh, youth suicide at a higher rate than any other race. We have alcohol and drug addiction at higher rates than any other race. Our men are, um, you know, face police brutality and, and death from police um, at higher rates than any other race. And all of this is become is because of these stereotypes and biases that are are essentially taught early at an early age in elementary school and solidified by mascotry in high school. Um, so we need to make sure that we have accurate, fair representation and that there is meaningful and reciprocal relationships being built with indigenous communities and indigenous neighbors around these mascots. It's been challenging and I've been doing this, you know, several times a week now um, since May, really. I've been at uh, school committee meetings. Um, I've been talking with legislators. And as you know, Okiteo, we put together a panel um, to try to educate communities that was very successful um and educate legislators too um i don't think people are really aware of how damaging this type of representation really is i think your the panel i i attended uh i think your colleague larry spotted crowman called the mascot visual terrorism yes which i think is a very clear way to frame it um for a lot of people i, I guess i'm always interested in asking who shuts down or says no when you point that out? Where, who is the what is the argument or what you get back from a school official or a legislator who doesn't see the it, harm in something like that? What's the it's case? It's always the same. It's always the same. Like I, I could probably break down the same comments every single time. <laughs> and it's it's our tradition, not not mine, but um, the pro mascot people always say it's our tradition, it's um, it's our history. Erasing mascots will erase native people. Erasing mascots will erase history. Um, taking away native mascots will erase uh, education about native people. Um, I'm a proud Indian. I, you know, bleed blue and white. Um, I will always be an Indian. I will always be a tribe member. I will, you know, um, there's this fear of change and maybe a fear of recognizing the harm that's done. You know, it is a racist thing because it is, it's a race-based, you know, mascot. They were the only race that's used as mascots, you know, not uh, leprechauns are imaginary and Vikings are not oppressed and uh, cowboys and patriots are a profession that you choose. So we're the only race that's used. It is a racial mascot. And I think that people hear that and they want to, I'm not being racist, I'm honoring. I'm honoring indigenous people. But honestly, when, you know, you say you want to honor, then then listen to Native people and listen to the hurt and the harm that it does. We're not being PC police. We're just asking you to really care about our communities and the effects that this has on our communities. 
Um, like I said, these comments, they are textbook. Like I get them every single time. And so we try to, you know, head that off with, this is not honoring. Um, this is actually hurtful and it's harmful. And we're not taking away your memories. Like we, we, you will always have your memories and you can build something stronger with your community, something that is not oppressing a minority um, culture, something that you all can be proud of. And I, I'm seeing that there, the change is happening. Um, more often, I think we've seen about eight or nine schools uh, since this summer that have made the change on their own, which is fabulous. Of course, that's the one bright, shiny spot in COVID, if you can call it that, which is, <laughs> but is that we've been able to bring our indigenous community to these communities with mascots and have Zoom meetings. Otherwise, forget it. I'm not traveling two and a half hours each way to sit on a school committee meeting in a hostile environment for four hours and then drive back two and a half hours. That's just not going to happen. I can't do that. But I can participate several times a week in these community meetings and these school committee meetings mm -hmm. via Zoom. And it's been incredible. I think the cruel irony or, or hypocrisy in this idea of erasing tradition is that it's built on centuries of erasing the oh, people we're asking absolutely. not to be represented this way. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's the recognizing how Native mascots were started was at a time when Indigenous children were being removed from their homes in a policy, a policy of intentional cultural genocide. Children were being removed to boarding schools where they removed culture, they removed language, they changed your clothes. They basically took away everything and told you that you were a dirty Indian, like you needed to be white. And at that time, um, you know, basically the non-native population was looking for an identity in the common melting pot country. And what they discovered was, well, we can honor the fallen savage and you know, westward expansion, manifest destiny, and use native people as mascots. Um, and that sort of began the control of how we are represented. Like we haven't had much control over how we are represented to mainstream society since then. I want to remind folks that they can drop questions in uh, for Rhonda in the chat and they come to me and then I'll, I'll pitch them forward. We talked to again about this trip we took recently and one of the things i mentioned to you was um along these lines uh, the legislation to change the state seal and i thought what was really um notable about your response was the question if it's really um a burden that the native community should be have to be um, um taking up uh, how to move forward with that but you are the commissioner for, for Indian Affairs for Western Mass. I, I wonder either in that capacity, but also just as a person, where you stand on that process and, and, and what you would like to see that process look like if it's going to change. Oh, so the state flag and seal has a commission um, that was set up. And the commission at, was very heavily native, which... You know, kudos for the nod, but at the same time, you know, um, this is a non-native issue that was created by non-native people. And, you know, in order to have this pass legislation, there needs to be legislators working on this commission to create a new seal so that they can feel good about voting for it. They can feel good about supporting it. And, you know, we don't, we shouldn't have to, um, you know, come up with an identity for the entire state. Like there's, there's, there's lots of different things. And if, and if there is a nod to Native culture, then that should be um, decided by Native people here. Um, but there's lots of things uh, to be proud of in Massachusetts that don't revolve around, you know, indigenous identity or representation. And um, we don't, 
it is kind of um, that would be like revamping the flag and you know making it more of an accurate flag, but then it would still be representing a race or representing human beings, and that is problematic. Even if it's an amazing representation, that's still problematic. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> yeah, I think you did. It's necessarily complicated. Um, can you tell us more about the work at Yukiteo? Because that that was a panel that I that I did see, and I think you've done just a remarkable series. And we'll put the website address into the chat, but um, the videos are all there, which I think is a great resource that you've provided for people who are looking to educate themselves. Um, what's coming up, and uh, related to that, how is COVID impacting your ability to really serve um, the communities that that the organization was started to serve? Oh my goodness. So, um, right, so I'll just start with the COVID part. We were just getting started um, with Okiteo, and we had really, you know, we had an amazing event uh, to welcome Solstice and the New Year, and COVID hit. And it felt like all of our programming that we had set up for the year was now up in the air and it was questionable. And what do we do? Um, it took several months for us to, to feel like um, we felt comfortable doing a hybrid event, which is where we did the last three events uh, through Okiteo. And we were able to um, partner with Double Edge Theater um, and howl round. Uh, so I felt like that was that was the turnaround point. We were able to work with um, social media and Zoom and and actually reach more people, I feel, um, by doing a program like that. Now winter is setting in. <laughs> and these hybrid events are now sort of, in limbo again, like how are we going to be able to do this comfortably? Um, you know, because we really technically should be outside or have, you know, outside fresh air if we're, you know, a couple of us doing this in person. Um, so it has impacted. We have um, we have been listening to what the native community wants, um, what issues the native community has. And uh, we've been trying to put together panels um, that, that will educate the larger community as well as um, get out the voices of indigenous community and center and lift indigenous issues and voices. Um, I know after, after the, the paddle, I am so, I am very excited to hopefully be working with All Out Adventure, Adventure and, and get our Native youth outside. And I feel, especially for the winter, that's going to be really critical. So I'd like to be able to do um, work on programming, educating about certain traditions like the snow snake, um, some cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, getting our youth outside. Um, so I think we'll be focusing a little bit more on, on our own community well-being and health. And then as um, the weather opens up a little bit more, we can do some more um, educating in the larger community with more panel work. I'm going to start to jump into the questions. We've got a, a great group of people here that have, have brought up a, a lot of good issues and you can respond as you wish to them, but I think that um, uh, we're going to give them some time here. So the first one asks, um, what indigenous peoples want from land trusts that now own and steward their ancestral lands? Is that a question that um, that you can respond to, at least from your perspective? Um, I'm just trying to look and see. I just, I, oh, I went into the chat. I didn't go into the questions because I wanted to, to, to be able to read it and like, uh, so, Land trust, um, there's a movement called Land Back, and uh, some of the land trusts are kind of uh, instituting policies that are based on a Land Back um, idea or initiative. So 
Indigenous people have been dispossessed of their traditional lands and we are people of a, a place. We do not consider ourselves separate from land, but we consider ourselves a part of land. And how we identify as people also pertains to the land that we come from or the land that we're on. This dispossession has caused Indigenous people to no longer be able to um, procure traditional foods that are relevant to their diets and their cultures and um, medicines that are also relevant um, to cultures and, and health. And not having access to these medicines and these foods has been enormously damaging over hundreds of years. And so providing access, like a land back access, will allow Native people to be able to grow their own food, to forage for their own food and medicines. Um, it's a place of reconnecting their communities to their places since time immemorial. It's beneficial on so many levels, and I'm extremely grateful to be seeing this, uh, to see this happening in Massachusetts. This is also, uh, in a way, a land-related question. Uh, why is there so much political support for the current administration in Alaska, uh, given their support for extractive industries and, and the anti-climate position? And um, I know that's a complicated question that, that has a lot of um, people living in contradiction, <laughs> certainly, right now. But from your perspective, what, what do you think is at the root of that contradiction? Okay, so there's a lot going on there. As you said, it's very complicated. <sighs> so, um, Anupiat, we were not dispossessed of our land. Most of our tribes were not dispossessed of our traditional villages and land um, as such. I mean, obviously, Anwar uh, was taken from us. <laughs> but we, because there, the United States had already um, began a policy of extractive industry um, on many different fronts and levels through mining, um, through logging, extra, you know, oil industry. The Anupia especially, well, Alaska Land Plains Settlement Act divided Alaska into 13 different districts. And each one of those districts was given a corporation to oversee um, all of the industry that is there. So I belong to uh, Koktovik Anupiat Corporation and Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. Arctic Slope Regional Corporation uh, and Koktovik Anupiat Corporation will be overseeing the drilling that's going to be happening on the North Slope. So that means potential money. Doesn't mean jobs for Anupiat people, but it means potential dividend payout. Um, so living up in the Arctic Slope is very challenging and uh, very expensive. You know, it's like $12 for a gallon of milk and, you know, a jar of peanut butter is going to run you eight to $10. So having money to live up there and buy gas for your snow go so you can go hunting, um, that's huge. Um, a lot of, there's military bases in Alaska that also um, are very Trump leaning. I'm sorry. I'm like, I have a dog that's trying to bite me. So <laughs> I knew it was a dog. I just knew it. <laughs> he wants my attention. He always comes over to me when I'm on Zoom and tries to get my attention. He's worse than a cat. <laughs> um, anyway, so it is a very complicated um, and very divisive issue. There are a lot of Anupia, myself included, I uh, have a lot of family in Koktovik that do not want drilling um, for obvious reasons because it will um, limit access. It will, you know, you just can't go back. When extractive industry happens on land, it's never the same. And a lot of this extractive industry that's happening is, believe it or not, fracking. So there's, you know, tailing ponds, this water, um, the water that's there is precious. Um, we're, we're being silenced left and right too. Um, I, have, I have spoken when I was in DC, I have cousins that are officers in Koktovik and Nupiat Corporation and Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. 
they're my cousins. And when I'm speaking, you know, it's not easy. I get to come home to Massachusetts and not deal with the fallout in my own community. That makes me a pretty good spokesperson, but I also get um, lateral violence from family that says I shouldn't be speaking because I live in Massachusetts. So yeah, it's a complicated issue. <laughs> Here's a question that I think is, is related, but is also a, a difficult one. Um, Robert asks, when dealing with the colonial mindset, there's always a level of guilt, I think, on the, on the part of the colonialist, uh, that shuts down any real internal dialogue and understanding and makes it possible for many to hear you. It makes it hard for many to hear you, but not to meet you um, maybe where you are. How do you counteract that? So I think what he's asking here is like, what is your hope for really getting dialogue that's going to make change so that people are meeting indigenous communities where they're at, acknowledging them, and then actually being able to be um, the type of supportive uh, allies and, and neighbors that they need to be in order to, to move things forward? Oh, one thing comes to mind, listening just doing some deep listening. Listen to what we have to say. Listen to our issues. Um, do that deep listening. Um, you don't have to respond. You don't have to, you know, give excuses. You don't have to say anything, just, just listen. And then listen on how you can become a good neighbor and a good ally and a good accomplice. You know, we need accomplices just as much as we need allies, you know, and how to do that. Um, just listening, that's all we ask for. <laughs> and I think that that goes a long way. I'm gonna remember that term accomplice too, because I think that that's a, an important one to think about. Yes, listening. Uh, a question here that I think is uh, maybe on a more practical level. Can you talk about your role as, as a commissioner uh, for, for Indian Affairs in Western Mass, what that entails, how that looks on a day-to-day -day basis as far as your work? Okay, so um, as Western Massachusetts um, Commissioner on Indian Affairs, I make sure that um, tribal um, voices are heard. Um, I make sure that, that there's a seat at the table for them when there are issues that are dealing with, you know, Native things. So um, there was recently, there is recently an issue going on in Northampton about a roundabout. So I was making sure that um, Indigenous communities weighed in on how they thought the process needed to go. Um, making sure that we have appropriate um, legislation going through to to meet the needs of indigenous communities, um, you know, making sure that that we're we're have a hand in writing laws on how uh, communities are recognized in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> it's it's a lot. I've been busy. Um, <laughs> I think. Um, most importantly is making sure that we have you know a working a working body to represent indigenous people in massachusetts i think i'm going to reserve the last question uh, for myself and ask if people want to support okate and they want to i think continue to um to follow your work, uh, uh, what can they do? How can they participate? Um, and how, how can they contribute to your efforts? Okay, so okateo.org is our, um, our website. Um, we do have um, a tab on Okateo that does have resources uh, on the issues that we're working on through Okateo. So I, I wholeheartedly encourage people to go there um, for information. Thank you. Ronnie, your time is very, very valuable and, and your perspective is even more valuable. So I, I really appreciate you being part of this with us today. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, for uh, having me on today and, you know, opening that door for me to <laughs> bring out an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, 
thank you very much for centering Indigenous voices. I appreciate it. It's honestly an honor for us. Um, this recording will, this video will be on our YouTube page, Mass Humanities YouTube. We'll also be um, posting it on our Facebook and Twitter pages. We are back on November 19th with the beginning of a new series called Let's Talk About Our Democracy. Uh, it's a three-part series. I think it'll continue to be very timely. And like this one, um, it'll be participatory. So we'll really want all of your opinions and thoughts and, and reactions to the speaker that we bring with us. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for supporting the humanities in Massachusetts. Be well.